researcher on super diversity at the University of Birmingham. Uh, you are also, as I know that well, <laughs> the co founding member of Migration Studies. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm not sure I'm going to detail all your middles because <laughs> it's going to take the whole panel. <laughs> But you are one of the leading scholars in migration studies in the UK. <laughs> one way to put it. Thank you. And uh, you're going to, to prepare, uh, you're going to present uh, today, we must stop the scam age, migrant death, and the politics of money, which is a political Europe migration crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it, it, what I try to do today is building on um, a research I've been doing since the uh, well, about 10 years now, or around the Mediterranean migration crisis and the construction of the crisis. I'm going to look in particular to some aspect related to the way that uh, key politicians in Europe um, discussed and uh, acknowledged uh, migrant deaths. And the, the role of this sort of public expression of mourning had in, uh, in the change in the European policy responses to uh, to migration from the Mediterranean, the, in the, through the Mediterranean. Um, uh, linking up to something that was mentioned yesterday, you know, we often refer to the refugee crisis, the migration crisis uh, as a 2015-16. So I, I put that photo from 2008, and this is the, the boat cemetery in Capo Passero, Sicily, just to give you a sense of how, uh, even when we talk about the refugee crisis in inverted comma, the temporalities of the crisis really has got different uh, trajectories. And if you look at European level and national country, country level, but also local level. So, but it's not the topic of the presentation today, anyway. Um, so the kind of question I'd like to sort of reflect on is, uh, is around uh, the way that have the migrant death impacted on the production of the EU uh, migration crisis and now in what ways the visibility or visibility of that bodies has shaped the responses and vice versa? And finally, who does mourn uh, and claim whom, which is a, a sort of set of kind of question. Who, who are the people that are basically expressing sympathies and uh, their condolences and which groups receive or are the target of these condolences? It's quite an important aspect to understand the development of uh, what we have witnessed since the mid to 2010s. Um, the, the way I'm going to proceed is, is just to give you very sort of uh, basic sort of uh, facts in inverted commas around the, the 2015-16 refugee crisis, 13 to 16 refugee crisis, uh, a, a few sort of uh, conceptual um, underpinning for the argument, and then we'll look at some examples of, the, of how key politicians in Europe responded to three events in particular. Uh, in which there were a large number of migrants that died in the crossing uh, while crossing the Mediterranean. And, and finally, and, and I will use this assembly to highlight a way in which way, and uh, yes, this was mentioned already yesterday, uh, the, in a sense, the, the, the ambivalence which is embedded in European responses to, uh, to the death at sea, you know, the humanitarian narrative, which has also a control dimension to it, and try to see how within this, um, uh, state public statements you can read some of the underpinning logic of the the responses uh the european both at, at the european level and national level to to the arrival let me see so the, the in terms of the, just as a reminder to um uh, between 2014 and 16 it was about 1.6 million people crossed the mediterranean um in 2015 alone about 845,000 people traveled to to greece from turkey while 153,000 uh, crossed from from mostly from Libya uh, to to Italy. Over this period, over two, the period of 2015, there were um, about 3,771 people that were either dead or missing uh, over, missing, over the period of, of time. Uh, just again to slightly destabilize the notion of crisis, I've, uh, I've um, uh, I wanted to share sort of this graph in which you could see the. The, the arrival how they went so the the, the cyclicity of the arrival is particularly if you look from the perspective of the the central mediterranean route is particularly interesting uh, however it's also relevant to, to see how the peak uh, in terms of arrival arrival in greece is also very so to much more time confined let's say so what happened as a result of this arrival this stage there was a significant transformation of the of the governance of migration 
in the Mediterranean. We saw, for example, the significant expansion of the role of Frontex. There was the creation of the network of the, of the hotspots, as particularly in the southern Mediterranean border. Uh, there was the launch of the attempt to a redistribution scheme, which uh, the, the, the uh, uh, migrants or asylum seekers were in theory being moved in other European member states, although it not work very much. Uh, the crisis also played a significant role in uh, um, in uh, anti-migrant anti politics, both at European and international level. This is the time in which uh, you have people like Tr Donald Trump, uh, Salvini, you have Brexit, all uh, political uh, sort of uh, figures in, with, that used the, the, the refugee crisis as a way of mobilizing political support. So the refugee crisis became also uh, has got several life in the political life of, of Europe and, and internationally as well. Um, and we also saw in terms of the transformation of the global, uh, the global governance of migration, this is the period in which there was the launch of the global compacts on, on uh, refugees. There was a global compact of migration, uh, which are soft law uh, instruments, um, as well as a debate around the definition of with a migrant of refugees became much more central in the governance mechanism. There was all this debate about how these migrants, uh, the mixed motivation, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a period that uh, very much the crisis, um, and I, I mentioned in Vertecoma because it's as I said produced, but also in itself produced significant transformation in, in, the, in the governance of migration and more, more broadly. Um, how and to what extent the, the migrant death play the role in this process is, is what I'm trying to, to look at in, in this presentation. Uh, we, everyone here will be familiar with the work of Judy Butler that's pointed out at the way in which those who we mourn or we don't mourn in a sense define the, redefine the border of humanities, but also create in a sense a claim of community. Um, and, and this work is also has got clearly a, a political underpinning as, as uh, either then we point out that there is not only about the definition of humanity, but in a sense specific groups or the decision about who to mourn also enables specific political projects, forms of politics to emerge while sometimes obfuscating others. The, the, um, and the three moments that I found um, played a significant role in this development. And, and I'll try to link up the specific uh, events, tragedies, to shift in the, in the governance of migration that occurred in, uh, in Europe at the time, are in particular the Lampedusa uh, shipwreck of October 2013, um, the, the, uh, the, the several tragedies that occurred within the space of a week in which about 1,200 people died uh, in, uh, in April 2015, and, and finally the um, the death of Alan Kurdi in um, August 2000, 2015. This moment became an initiated in the, in the political and, and policy debate with Europe, a significant shift in the approach. So if you look at particular at the, the Lampedusa um, shipwreck of 2013, uh, and the apologies for the fonts, there was a problem with the movement between uh, versions. Uh, um, they, they, they became the, the reason or the, in the sense the push for a shift in the, the approach to search and rescue operation that was the launch of the so-called Mare Nostrum operation that led within 12 months to the rescue of about 1,153,000 uh, people. The following the, the, the April 2015 um, um, tragedies, we saw a transformation again of the, of the search and rescue uh, uh, approach, but also broader transformation in terms of the resources allocated to the governance of the mobility within the Mediterranean. So what was the period in which we had the launch of what is called Triton Plus approach, um, which was a Frontex you led operation with an hybrid mandate. And finally, everyone will remember the, res the public and political responses to the death of Alan Kurdi. Um, this is uh, the, the, the last photos of him alive, so rather than use the, the that was, a, was a circulated in the media, and um, in which basically led to an Angela Merkel and Germany adopting an open door policy in the, in, uh, in the month following the Alan Kurdi death. In one month alone, you had about 200,000 people crossing into, into, uh, into Greece uh, from, from Turkey. 
So um, what I'm going to do next is to look at um, some of the, of the, of the statements that, that were issued following this three tragedy. So first I'll start with, uh, uh, this is the only one in Italian, the other one I'll translate, I'll, I'll translate myself. I could, uh, so this is uh, Gianni Letta, the, the, um, Enrico Letta, the then Italian prime minister of Italy, who, who um, was a non-elected prime minister. This is a very important thing because he is a very strong Catholic ethos. The event in Lampedusa occurred just a few weeks after the, um, a few months after the appointment. I don't know if for a Pope, do you say appointment? But the appointment of Pope Francis, uh, who has always had a very strong position in relation to the migrants. And actually Lampedusa was his first international trip and in which he basically called the event a disgrace. So you can see how, and this is linked to the politics of migration I mentioned before about Trump and Salvini. Uh, how the non-elected dimension play a role, but it's not essentially. So what, what Johnny Letter says here is acknowledging the significance of, uh, um, of, of the event, saying that Italy would make of, of immigration a central issue in national uh, political agenda, but also at European level. And uh, when Italy is going to take the position as a leading the European Council, which was actually happening soon after, he will make this at the center of uh, the European agenda itself and get, this is interesting, the European Commission involved. Okay, one of the elements which we can follow through in uh, during the period of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the refugee crisis is the shift at the tension between national, uh, European and global level of governance. Who is involved? Who claims the life of the people that have? Who is using those life and those dead bodies in order to legitimize a shift in, in, the, in the power relations and the governance of migration. So what we see here is that Italy from the beginning is trying to get the European Commission involved. Uh, it's interesting that if we look at other key politicians at the time, the emphasis was much more on the role of the European Council, which if you're familiar with the architecture of European institution, the European Council is where the prime minister meet together. So it's actually is the place where prime minister decide things while the European Commission is meant to be the, the communitarian level of decision making. So it's a quite significant difference. The, the, the then French uh, president um, Hollande, um, it, it responding to on the 25th of October to, to the tragedy of Lampedusa, I said, he pointed out that it's a human tragedy, which isn't the first and unfortunately isn't the last. Even today, reporter reaching us and arousing strong feelings and solidarity. These are legitimate with regard to the disaster and to this human situation. Uh, but they also raise a question, won't there be an influx of refugees in the coming weeks and months? Okay. So while there is an acknowledgement, interesting in the statement of the, of the significance of the sentiment and the solidarity which is triggered by the event, there is actually very interesting immediately a, a border control agenda coming up in which he shows a, a, a concern for the arrival, not of irregular migrants, but it's concern of arrival of refugees, which is quite an interesting sort of in terms of the language, which have seen, we have seen through uh, over this period. And he come up with a three point agenda in, in following up to the state in the same statement, um, basically deciding that they're gonna target the countries of origin and transit, uh, that we're going to in, in increase the power of the border checks and the monitoring of borders through the role, for example, of, uh, of Frontex and Eurosur. And then, and this is interesting, combating traffickers and trafficking. Um, when, when you look at uh, the way that I've been looking at the statement, apartheid was very interesting to see how do they identify the victims? Who are these victims? Are they refugees, irregular migrants? Uh, what's the problem with the, that leads to this migration, but also uh, what's the solution is actually a way of reading this statement. It's clear here that it's identifying as a main issue of, uh, that is affecting these refugees, because it's used before, the, the role of traffickers. As we receive with the next uh, statement from uh, uh, Matteo Renzi, written in an editorial for the New York, New York Times in April 2015, two years later, um, the, the, it's very important to observe also uh, which group deserve, in a sense, our emotional response. So what uh, Matteo Renzi says in 2015, after the 1,200 uh, people that have died in, in one week alone, the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, cradle of our civilization, is becoming a deathbed for thousands of nameless, desperate men, women, and children. 
These people had lives full of pain, despair, and hope, which led them to become victims of human trafficking. The voices of mothers lost their children at sea will haunt our conscience. We must stop this carnage. Why I found this very interesting? Because while there is a call for intervene, we need to stop this carnage. What we want to pay attention to here is why? Why, why we need to stop the call? Where, where is the, the moral obligation come from? What the foundation was a moral obligation. And one interesting first is the claim of the territory. No, this is our, this is the cradle of our civilization. Things are happening in the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean is ours. And so we have a responsibility to intervene first. Who is responsible for this is the human trafficker and is human trafficker. In fact, we all remember that one of the first things that was actually launched after the, was the war on traffickers has been at the core. And with the very interesting, in the case of uh, Renzi, the use of trafficker rather than smugglers, all through is actually speech in English, um, which as he's got quite good political advice, that is not by chance, I would say. And, and finally, which is also interesting, is the place where this death occurred, which is actually really important at sea. Why does it matter? It, it, because as we will see later, a lot of the strategy that get implemented in response to the death is all based about not having uh, more people dying at sea. And we know that they are still dying, but not, certainly not at the same level that in this period. It doesn't matter if people die elsewhere. I mean, this is quite an interesting way of, of positioning the, the narratively the statements. Other politicians uh, express their sympathies and their, their solidarity and their condolences. However, what they do, and, and this is really interesting, they use again the, the, uh, this expression of condolences also for positioning themselves um, in, uh, in, in relation to where they see uh, the role of their own country. One, what, one thing that really interests me is and as if you have followed the development of the, of the responses by the, the discussion between different countries, it is quite telling here where um, David Cameron says that, yes, search and rescue operations are really important, but that's not the solution. Actually, one of the key aspects of the British position, especially at the beginning, was the search and rescue, uh, rescue operation were actually causing the increase in the number of people crossing. And there has been also an issue that was discussed in Parliament around this. But the other thing which is also interesting is that while Italy was pushing for the, the, the involvement of the European Commission and was actually saying this is a tragedy which is not Italian but is European, the British are saying, yes, it's a European tragedy and we will help you, but because we are not European. In a sense, it's also in projecting this solidarity, it's also distancing themselves. We saw how we end up after that, you know, there is Brexit coming the following year. And uh, it, so we are not surprised by that position. Um, and again, the instead, the final moment that really triggered the response. We saw the change in policy following Alan Kurdi death, the, the open door policy that, that uh, Germany, um, I'm sorry Allah, for this, is not all on, on, on screen. Um, uh, what is interesting, yeah, and, and I, I have also the statement from the other uh, prime minister I can, I, I can refer to in a second. Um, it, it's this reference that Britain will act with its her head and art, providing refuge for those in needs while working on a long-term solution to the crisis. Again, he's sort of saying that they, we cannot only re, re, rely on the search and rescue operation, but it's also in a way, a, a way of within, through the public statements of grief, to establish a confirmed national and geopolitical interest. There is very much the idea that the death of migrants become a way of legitimizes, legitimizes a political and military intervention in areas of crisis. And this is really interesting because we have seen also more recently the fact that the fact that there is so many refugees become a way to say, the refugees are coming here, we need to do something, we can intervene that legitimize our position to save the refugees from, from having to leave their country of origin. So this dimension of the macro politics linked to the movements, I think is something to, to keep an eye on in, in the way in understanding the development of the, of the um, European responses to the, the refugee crisis in that um, the, the The second quote is from, from Angela Merkel, as we know, she, she uh, no, actually there is another one from, 
Um, and actually, the other point from David Cameron is that the role that he is going to help by taking people from refugee camps. So even in the middle of a major crisis and with uh, thousands of people dying, it was still, as we have seen recently, if you want to link up what's happening with Ukrainian refugees, this very firm position by the British government that we don't want people to come directly here. We only take people that have already been recognized as refugees and we transfer them in the country. So as, as an approach to asylum. Um, uh, because we want to save them from doing hazardous journey. So again, you can see this. If you construct the danger associated with the with the sea, the death of migrants, only in relation to the Mediterranean water, this indeed become, as you can see here, we are legitimizing the fact that we can stop there on land. Uh, and this is partly why with other work we have done uh, as, as part of the work with uh, Evan Crowley and, and uh, Frank Duell and Simon McMahon, uh, it was also to, to, to highlight in, in an article that came out um, recently with um, an international migration review, instead the extent to which experience of, of violence and death were actually very much common in the experience of the people that actually made the journey. So understanding how people face the risk of the sea, you can only understand if you understand what's the risk before the sea in, in many ways. And it's something that in European responses, in the political response, it's something that want clearly obfuscate. And this is the point about you know, the politics of visibility and invisibilization of, uh, that is really in, important to bear in mind. Um, and Angela Merkel instead, the emphasis of the response is more on the right. Now we need more Europe, the more Europe approach. So it's, it's, it's Germany open, open its door, but it's part of this process of Europeanization of asylum and, and uh, dealing with the arrival. So in many ways, what we see is that um, the, uh, the responses that we have seen before uh, very much become a way of justify the policy transformation is there almost a response to the tragedies. So the policy fall of the tragedy, two minutes. Okay. Yeah, wow. <laughs> No, that's fine. Uh, but, but, but however, it's also really important to look at the other way around. And this was mentioned yesterday in the discussion. To what extent, in many ways, we never not forget the fact that you can also read the same policy shift changes as, uh, as uh, the death has caused by European border policy. And you can basically look at different, if you use different chronology, you would read a different story. So for example, in the transition between Mare Nostrum to Triton, not Triton Plus, you can see the, the mortality rate in the, in the Mediterranean went up significantly. How do you see that? This is the, the fantastic work that forensic architecture has been doing for years, has been documented, is the fact that the, the rescue operation areas got much more restricted and, and uh, was not covering, this is very, so very briefly, the areas where the accidents were occurring. But also, if you can see the other one, this is from a, a, both major from a report from MSF. Um, was the different kind of uh, uh, infrastructure available. The rescue, the, the number of boats in the sea was significantly reduced. So you, the shift in policy produced death, you could argue as well. So how do we, how do we, how do we can, so it says what I try to do is to try linking up to what's also uh, Maurice Steele has been writing a uh, few years back. It's this idea that these official forms of commemoration like through the public statement by the politician not necessarily uh, uh, they become practice employed by the state and you leaders do not, uh, don't, uh, do not transform or unsettle understanding of citizenship and community. They create a humanitarian exception and disconnect the death from the violent politics of your border regime. So this idea is that um, in many ways, and, and this has also been presented as a, through the concept of the border spectacle as a schizophrenic. I, I think more than schizophrenic, actually, the point is to demonstrate how the ambivalence is produced within these policies, how the humanitarian narratives that we saw in those statements enable, become an enabler of a border control policy or the immigration control, which is done elsewhere from the sea. So as we could see, for example, and I'll, I'll close, uh, what we have seen here, the last two things, Oh, sorry. Here it is. So what we see is that basically the, the, the way that the European Union responds in relation to death has followed these three sort of kind of answer. One is the absence, so the saving humans at sea. We want them to disappear. 
the way of you use the, the, the migrant bodies, uh, making them distant, so pushing the externalization policies so they don't die in the area which we feel as our responsibility. If people die in Libya or like around the way, it's not our problem, never to come. And finally, also with the idea of the invisibilization of the body, we have seen, for example, the crime of solidarities. We have seen access to migration routes and infrastructure being restricted. We have seen the fact that how NGOs have been pushed out of the sea or they have struggled compared to the beginning. So the visibilization of the bugs. In conclusion, um, so the EU politics of mourning, uh, 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 one element is but the EU politics of mourning is anchored to the parcel of the Mediterranean Sea. And this anchoring plays a very significant role in terms of enabling migrant death, dead bodies to be weaponized to achieve immigration control and border closure against living immigrants, living migrants who are immobilized on land with attempt to integrate them, for example, in the labor market in routes. This is all the global combat agenda, uh, which I'm bypassing by. Uh, the creation of condition of the, like the one we've seen the debate of the slave market in Libya, in a sense, is the top of an iceberg, which uh, is linked to the process of commodification, commodification of migrant bodies, which has been and the use of migrant bodies as bargaining chip, both for profit, but also for geopolitical reason. We have seen now, for example, the, the use of the migrants issues as a way to exert influence on a lot of countries en route to Europe, even if the people were not en route. And finding the public expression of grief have gradually dried up. And this is actually a question. What we notice, and, and I know that has been pointed out, that nowadays people are still dying in the sea. No one is issuing any more statements. We, do, we don't really have a, a prime minister writing about it. And what I'm wondering about is what does it mean in terms of the migration governance? And this is, I think, is an open question. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about my uh, being a very bad chair, but I was so absorbed Sorry. by your, your, your presentation, I forgot it right. So, Diana, you're next. Right, so Diana, you, Diana Bonti, you are a district candidate at the uh, Department of International Development, and uh, you're going to present part of your research. And so, so this time, we shift from uh, the policy narratives to more um, NGOs and active narratives. Thank you very much. Um, coming after Nando is actually perfect because I feel like I pick up exactly where he left off. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm presenting part of um, the work that I did in my, my master's research. Um, so, yeah, um, just, just get right in. Um, so just to give you a bit of a structure of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a little bit of context without going too much in depth because we've just done that. And also, I'm sure that all of you are very aware of what's happening in the Mediterranean anyway. Give you a little idea of how I went about this research. Um, and then um, looking at the four main themes that I found in, in it and discussing it more generally. So um, I will start off with some of the context that is relevant, but um, yeah, we're not going too much in, in, uh, in depth. So as most of you know, Italy's original search and rescue operation that was launched in 2013 was called Mare Nostrum. And as Nando was just talking about the name itself is quite political and it's imaginary because it takes in a way cultural ownerships of the Mediterranean Sea as a whole, um, an imaginary that um, utilizes the name that was given to it by the Roman Empire. So it's something that goes quite deep into Italian culture. Um, and also just um, was reused afterwards by nationalist movements in the country, such as like the fascist movements um, after unification and gives it a very particular understanding of where um, legitimacy of geographical spread reaches in Italy at the time. So the operation was stopped after one year, citing excessive financial burdens that it put on the Italian government and NGOs filled in to, to fill that gap. Um, so, uh, oops. So, yeah, after that, um, Italy became the epicenter of a lot of um debates around what was happening and the links um the presumed links between smugglers and ngos at sea 
Um, and this became very obvious also in the way it was talked about in Italy, the introduction of things such as the Codice Miniti, which was a code of contact, uh, conduct that was asked uh, for NGOs to sign. Um, my research in particular focuses on the subsequent period after the end of Mare Nostrum, um, which is the period that has been called by um, forensic oceanography as Mare Clausum, um, which was an undeclared operation of containment through multi-level policy between Italy, the Libyan Coast Guard and the EU. I was most interested in understanding how these circumstances, um, under circumstances actors that were engaged at sea were both understanding their legitimacy and their positionality um, as well as navigating the dynamics that contributed to um, the ide ideological formation of the border. So for this reason, it may be worth just having a very quick overview of the history of Italy Libya relations. This is by no way exhaustive. Um, so without going into much detail, especially of the brutal years of colonization of the 20th century that precede this, um, just a few of the agreements um, on migration control that go back into the 2000s uh, with cooperation agreements signed as far back as 2004 between Berlusconi and Gaddafi and being followed by the much more famous Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation of 2008, um, which was nominally about colonial reparations, but really included articles on cooperation and migration, which formed the basis of further technical and financial assistance, also including like the so-called Libyan Coast Guard. Um, so the latest agreement, um, as far as my research goes, was a memorandum of understanding. So something that was just at executive level on development, cooperation, illegal migration, human trafficking, fuel smuggling, and reinforcement of border security. So my in, the, in, in this context, um, the humanitarian mission of saving lives has become increasingly interlinked with securitization of incoming migration through the Mediterranean. Um, so my research um, analyzed the following question, how do relevant actors in the Mediterranean navigate between frameworks of humanitarianism and securitization to legitimize their own actions? Um, once again, without going into too much detail, um, I broadly speak to the literature on securitization as a discursive process and more specifically the intersection between humanitarianism, security, and the security humanitarian nexus in border spaces such as the Mediterranean. Um, and in particular, I am contributing to this area by presenting an analysis of these framings in contrast with each other. So to, to do this, I, um, I've used critical discourse analysis to analyze media and government resources. I have focused on the period of 2016, 2017. So following what we've just talked about um, for a number of reasons. So, um, First of all, because it's the period of the Mare Clausum operation that I just talked about. Secondly, because the 2017 Memorandum of Understanding divides this time frame into roughly two sections of before and after, which allows us to see if any like narrative shift had happened in the time. And then thirdly, it englobes events that um, are discussed in current ongoing legal cases, such as the SS um, and others versus Italy, which included um, interactions between Sea-Watch and the Libyan Coast Guard. I've collected um, data from NGOs and government press releases, as well as um, five different newspapers across uh, the Italian political spectrum to the best that I could. Um, overall, it included about 3,000 results, um, out of which I quoted about 130 relevant articles that um, I then found into four main themes which you can find uh, in this overview here. So um, a theme of evocative imagery, which goes both ways in like fear mongering and humanity bringing um, a use of international law, um, obviously the idea of security and securitization and um, the idea of humanity. So not all of them use all of these themes in equal ways, but there's a lot of overlap in the way these are used by actors at sea. Um, so to start uh, with employment of the law, when I talk about employment of the law, I'm talking about the selective employment of legal frameworks and obligations to justify oneself and criticize the other. So in the case of the state, what this means is taking a very narrow understanding of international legal obligations. Um, in this case, to focus on anti-trafficking and anti-smuggling conventions, um, as we just talked about, for example, in 
um, focusing on things like the Palermo Protocol. Um, here I present two quotes. Um, one is from Luigi Di Maio, who was the time out of the Five Star Movement, who says, who pays for these Mediterranean taxis? Why do they do it? We will submit a question in Parliament and we will get to the bottom of the story. Um, the second quote is from Carmelo Zucchero, who was a chief prosecutor of Catania at the time, um, which says, human traffickers directly call NGO vessels. In my opinion, some NGOs could be financed by traffickers. And I know of contacts. This form of trafficking today is as profitable as drugs. Um, so these obviously are just two exemplary quotes of the kinds um, of things that I've mentioned in this team about the main three teams in this area are the pull factor narrative, which was also just mentioned, the idea that NGOs um, are first of all, um, making more people get on boats at sea by the fact that they are there to rescue them, but also the idea that NGOs are colluding with smugglers for their own profit and um, overall just making the crossing more dangerous for migrants. Um, in digging into this narrative, um, I found out that, well, it was started in a Financial Times publication in December of 2016, no, yeah, 2016, um, and it was based on confidential Frontex reports, um, which accused NGOs of smuggling, or colluding with smugglers. The Financial Times subsequently retracted the statement, admitting to overstating their um, accusations, but Frontex continued to consolidate them and they got picked up by national media, especially Italian national media, uh, quite a lot, as we can see from the, the quote above from um, Carmelo uh, Zucchero in particular. Um, Carmelo Zucchero's um, accusations were also entirely based on these reports, um, yeah, according to which um, NGOs would start search and rescue operations before any distress calls were actually sent to the um, rescue centers in Rome. Um, another image often heard and used by alt-right movements in Italy, and before looking into this once again, I thought they belonged to them, was the idea of sea taxis, um, NGOs as just like sea taxis to bring people over. But the first time it was actually used, it was by Luigi Di Maio, which um, is not part of an alt-right movement, it's a much more like a catch-all populist figure um, in Italy which ties directly into the third theme, that of criminalization of NGOs, the idea that they are smuggling people, they are going against um, international law. So how, does, how do NGOs um, justify their work and respond to these kinds of narratives and um, accusations? Um, they respond in, very, in, in a wide, um, in, in a lot of different ways. There's no real like NGO answer to these kinds of things. It depends a lot on the, um, on the NGO itself, the kind of culture that the NGO has and how it's used to dealing with governments. Um, but on a broad spectrum, what they do is they repeat that they save lives at sea and that saving lives at sea is not a crime. They are following maritime law and Illegal actions are happening at sea, but these are under the responsibility of Italy and the European Union, such as the pushbacks done by the EU financed Libyan Coast Guard. Um, so they, yeah, they differ widely in their response. Um, here I put once again a couple of quotes. Um, sea Watch famously takes the most antagonistic stance against Italy in these contexts, as the quote shows. Um, they make threats of taking legal steps against the state for the defamation campaigns. Um, this one in particular was as a response to the Zucchero quote that I put earlier. Um, other NGOs such as uh, Médecins Sans Frontières focuses on highlighting what is left unsaid by um, the governments in their discourses, such as the omission of all of the cross Mediterranean agreements and Frontex operations at sea. Uh, calling it a great exercise of hypocrisy by European governments. Um, SOS Mediterranean, the other quote on the slide, uh, also emphasizes that NGOs are not the only actors present at sea, uh, mentioning that there's other vessels, um, merchant navy vessels, the Italian Coast Guard, the Frontex vessels. So there's, there's a lot of actors and a lot of different dynamics happening in that space. Um, MOAS, for example, is an um, 
is an NGO working at sea that always, always remained relatively pragmatic, taking quite defensive stances um, in these accusations, just emphasizing that their conduct always falls within the rules of the sea. Another, um, these kinds of relations were very obvious also in the way that people reacted to the code of conduct that Italy asked uh, NGOs to sign. Um, this conduct, uh, th this code required them um, commitment to among the other things like not enter Libyan search and rescue zones, um, not impede rescues in act by the Libyan Coast Guard, and uh, most controversially, allowing Italian armed police officers on their NGO boats. Um, uh, most of NGOs refused to sign it, which in turn didn't technically allow them to bring migrants or just like stop in Italian ports anymore. Um, but some did, such as Moas and Save the Children, um, justifying this as a pragmatic stance in order to continue being able to save lives at sea. The invocation of security, as um, we're all very aware, is a discursive strategy mostly employed by the state. Um, so this, the narrow focus taken by governments in the context of the Mediterranean crisis is often solely concentrated on combating, as the quote, shows criminal organizations against one of the most heinous crimes such as trafficking of human beings, which for huge economic profits go as far as segregating and torturing migrants. This kind of um, narrative choice of words just obfuscates the involvement of the EU in running, uh, for example, financing the detention institutions um, in the Libyan shore that um, are actually the site for a lot of the, the torturing and the human rights abuses that are condemned by the European government. Um, the idea of NGOs as death merchants and enemies and cooperators. Um, but also something that comes up a lot is this kind of ambivalent stance um, with Libya um, as a whole, because it they, they simultaneously recognize Libya as an unstable environment, as an unstable state, as a place that needs continued cooperation from the Italian government in order to keep it stable and stabilized while at the same time considering it a safe third country of return. And um, another, yeah, another main theme that is used a lot is the kinds of evocative imagery to um, bring in some sort of emotional reaction um, in people that hear these. And on one side, the, the, on the state side mostly, this, uh, rhetoric um, has been thrown in different metaphors, for example, the river of refugees that is back in full force or the human tsunami that has been set in motion. Um, once again, famously employed by the alt-right movements in Italy, but similar rhetoric has also been used by different politicians on the entirety of the political spectrum, which makes it particularly interesting to see how deep into the general imagery um, and also just acceptability in Italy it has gone, for example, um, the second, the, the last quote I have here is from uh, Matteo Renzi, at the time Secretary of the Democratic Party, arguing that we don't have the moral duty to welcome um, in Italy all the people who are worse off, and that doing so will be an ethical, political, social, and economic disaster. We do have a moral duty to help them and to help them in their homes. So once again, this idea of putting a separation, of doing it like not in my backyard, um, just a further entrenchment of global inequality in the way we talk about um, people that are on the move. On the other side, and actually the only side that ever really properly mentions migrants when um, in all of these discourses, at least that I've found, is the kinds of images that are employed by NGOs in response uh, to these security images of invasions. Um, so, while both of them sometimes use them, NGOs um, use universal ideas of humanity and suffering to evoke specific emotions, and the state in particular also uses it to highlight their contribution to search and rescue operations. So there's, um, on NGO side, ideas of mothers and children, marks, scars, skin diseases, infected wounds, to highlight the consequences of the policies that happen in the Mediterranean, and then simultaneously, the Italian Coast Guard 
presents the work in a video that was um, uh, on the website in 2017, describing themselves as the angels of the sea, the, the people that are saving lives uh, at sea, even though they don't have um, any strong search and rescue mandate anymore. So in going to discussion, I'm just going to bring three main themes. Um, the first theme is that of NGO criminalization. Um, so the, the way in which um, all of these demonization of NGOs has um, kept going on um, has led to several restrictions to the kind of work that they were able to do at sea. So the ways in which this discourse is, is not just um, on a theoretical level, but very concretely um, affects the way in which people are able to, um, to do things, to, to just uh, be seen and also work um, in the Mediterranean. So the Codice Aminiti was an example, the, the Senate Commission recommendations at the time also for social regulations for NGOs at sea, and a clear narrative shift to media outlets between 2016 and 2017. The angels of the sea have uh, um, kind of lost their wings. Um, they, NGOs are met with a negative veil of suspicion. They, uh, their good faith is doubted, the humanitarian mission is debated. Um, this kind of mediatic demonization are on the same, at the same time, allowed Frontex and the Italian government in particular to obfuscate um, their role into all of these operations. And lastly, this use of NGOs as a mediatic scapegoat has allowed for the criminalizations of migrants and the EU citizens that were willing to act on solidarity, um, such as famous case of like Carola Rackete um, in Italy or uh, Mimo Lucano, which is another, um, really famous case. Um, the context of uh, Italy Libya relations as well, there's double think in the way they talk about it, it, Libya and they think of Libya. So at the same time as an unstable country, but also a safe country of return um, that people can be pushed back to um, and the return agreements can be made with, um, but also just kind of not talking about the invested interests that come in the relations between Italy and Libya that must be kept up. The amount of oil that um, is exported from Libya to Italy is about 30% of their entire exports. Um, and lastly, um, the, the use of international law for their legitimacy. Um, so on the one side, the careful craft of images of the sea by governments, um, show a place that is torn apart by criminals and only presents um, some of the actors that are actually um, working in that space. Um, the word of the use, the, the, the use of the word migrant indistinctively used for um, refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, victims of trafficking, all in the context of pushbacks and search and rescue, which at the same time restricts the allocation of the label of refugees, but also delegitimizes both migration in general and underplays non refoulement violations that are happening um, in this space. Um, and lastly, um, lost my thought. Um, lastly, the fact that um, we keep talking about um, international waters as a space that is rightless, as a space that has um, a gap in international law, when in reality, the these spaces have overlapping um, jurisdictions and frameworks of law that allows different actors to kind of selectively choose which parts they decide to um, discursively abide to and completely ignoring the others. Um, and that is my conclusion. I just brought this over again so that you could see them. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. We lost so much echoes with uh, yesterday's presentation of uh, Didier Passan. It's really, it's really wonderful. Uh, maybe you remind me also what uh, that search and rescue organizations and the boats and themselves are laboratories for to forge new narratives around migration. And I think some, some boats, we don't call them migrants or refugees or whatever, they call them guests. So they are also uh, matrix in itself. Uh, okay.
All right, so now we are moving to our last presenter, uh, which I'm very, very happy to receive today, Francoise Lestage, who is an anthropologist and professor at the University of Paris, and also a research researcher at the so you do the research in the Society. I'm very glad to have you because you are probably one of the pioneers of uh, 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 working on, on the issue of migration and death. I mean, started uh, so for me 15 years ago at a time when nobody was talking about migration and death. So, very glad to have you today. And to, uh, we are listening to you. It's a, it's a multi authored uh, presentation, uh, co authored with Carolina Kolbikobelinski and Kimiko Fury. And you are, we present uh, something about the databases for the dead border, border crossers, activists, and academic uses under scrutiny. Thank you very much, Thomas. And um, yes, this paper has been written with Carolina Kobelinski and Filippo Fouri. Carolina um, and Filippo have done fieldwork together in Catania, and I've done fieldwork with Filippo in the lower French Italian border. So I explain why. Um, in this conference, we talk a lot about the migrants who died at the borders of the global north, about the policies that produce these deaths, and about the activists or volunteers who try to prevent them or to make them visible. Some of them by developing databases to locate and trace the remains of people who have died during border crossing, and in some cases to set up investigations beyond those carried out by the police in order to identify them. Um, we, in this presentation, I will talk about two databases we have worked on, Carolina, Filippo, and I. We, I don't know. <laughs> uh, in 2018, Carolina and Filippo began to help to set up the one of, uh, one of the database in Catania, Sicilia, uh, that corresponds to a project the local Red Cross began to set up in 2017, at a time when the frequency of dead arrivals at the port of Catania was, become, was becoming less intense. As you know, hundreds of dead were found on the Catania beaches and Carolina and Filippo have already published uh, papers on the treatment of these deaths, often in line with the um, Alejandra's presentation this morning. Um, so in 2000, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm very good to manage this thing, the PowerPoint. Uh, uh -huh. In 2007 and 20, Filippo and I created one database in the French-Italian low border from Ventimiglia to Cannes, uh, where accidents have uh, occurred since 2015, either falls in the mountains, especially at a place called uh, Pas de la Mort, Death Pass, on the road or on the train tracks. Um, the two, one uh, on the lower French Italian border, we have so far recorded around 40 migrants who have died accidentally since 2015. Uh, 2015, uh, as Nando said, is a shift, and we, we began the databases in 2015. And in Catania, around 260 bodies have been buried since 2015. Um, in both situations, we observe the emergence of diverse and unexpected forms of relatedness, as Carton said, with the dead, especially among the officials we approached. These connections are not ritualistic, but they promote knowledge and make the dead more visible as we shall see through several case studies. In this presentation, we would like to raise a set of questions relating to the somewhat less visible and less public dimension of the databases. 
what does the database do in the everyday lives of the persons involved in building or using it, activists, but mainly undertakers, civil registry employees, police officers, etc. How does it intervene in the relationship between the living and the dead? In addressing these questions, we propose to explore the ways in which the emotion that emerge upon contact with the database contribute to visibilizing border death and to producing new afterlives for the dead by migration. Uh, first, I will tell you what sort of information you can find in, the, in, the, in these databases and how we produce these databases. So the production of both databases. Mm. The databases have common fields and specific fields. Uh, some of the fields are mm, the fields which are common in the, both databases are first names, if known, surnames, if known. It's the same thing, as you know, that in border US, Mexico border, in other place, nationality, if known, date of birth, if known, sex, common of burial, date of burial, etc. And each database has also specificities linked to the circumstances of the deaths and to the research that took place on the spot around the deceased bodies. In Catania, it's about the shipwreck, so search and rescue event, boat number of survivors, etc. And on the lower French Italian border, it's about the accident. Uh, the known date of the accident, the reference and date of the newspaper that publicized the information, uh, information on the stay in Italy preceding the death, etc. And some informations are only in the Catania database because they require access to information that is in police files, uh, we, which we have not had access to on the French Italian border. Like, size, uh, identity documents, photos, particular signs, we don't have in the database of the French Italian border. And the sources, how these databases were produced? The two databases are the result of two different types of collections. One on written sources, um, um, as civil registers, cemeteries, cemeteries, new regions, cemeteries, registers, newspapers, and other written sources. And uh, the other one on direct or indirect oral exchanges with persons involved in the management of the bodies, municipal officials, undertakers, forensic doctors, police officers, but also volunteers from organizations such as the Red Cross in Catania, or especially in the case of the Italian French border, with persons who had known the deceased before their death during their stay in Italy uh, uh, as priests, imams, or activists, mainly. On the French Italian border, um, I'm not very good. Uh, but to manage the PowerPoint, <laughs> sorry. Uh, on the French-Italian border, we brought first information in the newspapers and we found this sort of information and then we uh, managed to check it, to check the information with forensic, with the civil registers, with the cemeteries, etc. And uh, the municipal officials were often surprised by our questions and were amazed to learn that we could have a scientific interest in these deaths, which they had not managed differently from any others when they were doing their job. After this initial surprise, most of them offered to help us actively in developing the database. For example, one official from Ventimiglia Town Hall in Italy now monitors new cases and keep us informed. Or uh, the retired town hall secretary of Saint-Agnès near Monton in, in France 
has given us photocopies of the civil register and shown us where the graves are located in the cemetery. So the interest that we as researchers take in these dead people has modified how the civil servants look at the routine administrative operation and maybe their behavior thereafter. In Catania, it was different. In the beginning, at least, we met the employers of the different institutions through the Red Cross. The local committee had formalized institutional exchanges in order to provide systematic access to documents to the documents produced by the various offices. The first agreement was signed in March 2018 with the City Council of Catania so as to obtain the cooperation and the data of the Civil Registry Office the municipal funeral service, a cemetery, and any other institutions that might have information related to the dead. Next, an agreement was set up with the judicial authorities, which granted the team access to the courts and to law, and law enforcement agencies. At the same time, links were established with associations and other actors involved in the landings. Unlike the officials on the French-Italian border, our interlocutors in Catania did not seem surprised by our interest in the dead border crossers. All of them warmly welcomed the project from the outset and stressed the, import the importance of compensating for the lack of any official investigation aimed at identifying the deceased. Ultimately, the people involved in developing the databases, whether because of us or as a result of their own activism, engage in some kind of relationship with the deceased migrants once they became aware of the database. But what kind of relationships and what meaning can we give to them? These are the questions we shall now explore more in details. The database, um, the demand emanated from the researchers or produced in collaboration with them has served as vector allowing links to emerge and forms of relationship to be forged between those involved in managing the bodies and the deceased migrants at a level other than that of technical management or simply counting the dead. First, the database creates links between the actors, even indirectly by creating the desire to contribute to compiling the data. The technical tool, the database, therefore becomes a means of exchange and collaboration between different official institutions, but also with actors from non-profit organizations. Second, the database inspires new actions. Its development has led some of our interlocutors to reflect on better ways to pay tribute to the unknown dead. For example, talking with us about the migrants buried in the local cemetery, the former secretary of the town hall of St. Agnès, now a member of the town council, had the idea of putting a plaque near the grave. The grave is actually the grave is anonymous and has no name or date. The former town hall secretary is currently considering putting a plaque on the grave to make the migrant dead visible and to give them an existence in the cemetery like the other dead of the village because they have plaque on their graves. In Catania, the first identifications made thanks to the database have led to the production of new plaques to be placed in the cemetery, bearing the names of the deceased when known. And the members of the Red Cross involved in the project are currently considering organizing a ceremony at the cemetery, which would allow both a moment of recollection for the families who are already in contact with the local Red Cross and the visible recognition of the work done by everyone who contributed identifying the dead. So third, the database enhances pre-existing relationships between the actors responsible for managing the body and deceased migrants. For example, the imams of San Remo and Ventimiglia, it's not an imam, but it's someone in charge of the Muslim bodies, uh, based in, Vent in Ventimiglia, who were already dealing with the dead in the Muslim square of San Remo or the local cemetery of Ventimiglia. 
see in the database a form of recognition of their past work, which serves as an incitement to continue this work with the dead migrants in the future. This is also true of the undertakers, the employees of the municipal funeral home in Catania, who deal with the bodies, but whose job is rarely made visible. The interest we took in them, the time spent on their premises, listening to their stories about the dead, the many times the Red Cross team consulted them about a particular body or asked them a question that drew on their memories of an operation following a disembarkation was seen as a form of recognition of their work and in particular, as one of the employees remarked of the humanity with which they deal with these disaffiliated dead people. Repeated meetings to gather the information needed to set up the database, especially in 2018 and 2019, also brought up memories of these invocations. While there had been many dead bodies, especially in 2015 and 2016, sharing these memories, talking about them with us and among colleagues, revived emotions and affects that our interlocutors from the civil registry or the forensic police, to give just two examples, had experienced during the encounter with the dead. In this respect, the database has in a way reinvigorated and enriched links with the deceased. Now, what happened for, or with the civil service? For civil servants, by calling upon these actors, the researchers building the database gives them the legitimacy to express a form of empathy towards the dead and to bring to the surface of their consciousness that which was private and hidden. As Weber pointed out, Max Weber, in capitalist society, compassion and all deep feelings can only be expressed in the private sphere. In other spheres, especially in administration, but also in the economy, these emotions are considered dysfunctional. However, the database has a particular effect on the civil servants, firemen and undertakers involved with it, who feel concerned by the death and establish post-mortem relationships with the deceased that have an emotional component. It is as if the database made them aware that they belong to the same community. Regarding these communal relationships, Weber gives examples of a religious brotherhood, a neurotic relationship, a relation of personal loyalty, a national community, etc. But in the context of our inquiry, we could add the broader example of a community of humans. The actors involved in managing the dead are no longer just police or town hall officials faced with the border dead, but subjectivities affected as a collective group. In so far, as they are mostly young people who have died in dramatic circumstances and far from their relatives. Sometimes one of the border dead individually will be difficult, <laughs> affects them in particular, leading to a form of personalization in the relationship with this singular death. In Catania, some of our interlocutors continue to talk about the fate of two young Somalis whose relationship to one another is unclear, but who died in the Mediterranean and whose post-mortem examinations showed that they were seriously ill. The communal relationship observed at the lower French-Italian border take on much more significant expressions in Catania. Seeing the dead in dreams, talking about them to friends or relatives, and visiting them in the cemetery are all common practices among our interlocutors. Through these practices and discourse, affective ties and relationships of relatedness with the dead are forged, and these lie at the heart of the emergence of a new social inscription of the dead. We have argued elsewhere that these forms of attachment are features that draw them closer to the realm of kinship in a fairly narrow sense of the term and have named this particular bond a form of kinship by proxy. So, is that the conclusion? <laughs> Um, it, the database for civil servants produces a new form of commitment. 
This is not militant behavior, but rather a paradoxical form of commitment. It's profound in so far as it concerns ontologies, the meaning of life, but at the same time, it doesn't call into question either the person's function or his or her convictions. For most of the people we spoke to, this is not a political issue. For example, the municipal civil servant at Ventimiglia Town Hall who decided to monitor migrant days in order to add to our database, took the issue to heart, spoke about it with our colleagues and with our daughter, and found it meaningful both for our work and for our personal life. Now the news of migrant days and the fine she has to deal with are processed in two ways. First, through technical management of the file, and second, through our contribution to a tool that transcends her work. In the same vein, Mr. Mancini, who is responsible for the relationships between the undertakers and the cemetery in Catania, told us how these very special days accompanied him in his life outside of work. Mi portiamo a casa, we bring them home with us. He summarized, he spoke about them to his family, he visited their graves in the cemetery, he sometimes dreamed about them. And uh, I know there was a line. By getting involved in revising these databases and by wanting to fill in the gaps relating to the identity of the deceased, all our interlocutors give the deceased a multidimensional existence. Technical administrative, they are registered in the database. Local, their existence is mentioned in the cemetery. Religious, they are taken on by the imam and given a space in the Muslim square. Imaginary, they are present in dreams and collective practices that imagine in the course of family conversation or between colleagues, the lives that they might imagine the lives that they might have had. Moreover, the collaborative dynamics, exchange and dialogue between the actors involved in the management of the bodies becomes a product of the traces left behind by the dead. It's worth nothing that, uh, I'm sorry, I passed a part and I, this is the conclusion. For the activists and probably for most of the researchers, creating and maintaining this database is a strategy for subverting migratory negro politics and undoubtedly a way of preventing oblivion and often scribbing these anonymous and lonely dead migrants in a more collective social project. For the state agents involved in managing human remains, the databases with which they themselves do not create, but to which they contribute, create resonance with deep feelings of humanity and solidarity towards other human beings. These feelings encourage them to get involved in another way of managing these remains through the databases beyond the strict requirements of their job or role. In return, our interlocutor's commitment gives a place to the dead migrants within the society that has had to take responsibility for their material management. In doing so, it produces new form of existence for the deceased, either on paper, the database itself, or in a cemetery by scribbling their presence on a plaque, in conversations with family and friends, or in dreams. The modes of attachment that emerge in the company of these particular de dead people can be thought of as a site of hospitality, post-mortem hospitality. You finish your paper, but you don't hear with this will to invisibilize the, uh, this, this death and this, uh, uh, this uh, standpoint about uh, the migrant death. And then uh, with, uh, with Francoise, we have the response, uh, with the, uh, the necessity to respond to this invisibilization, this possibility to, 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 to accept this invisibilization. But it's not a political statement, but it's really a, a response. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ontological need. It's a, it's a reflex. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's much deeper than the, it's a pre-political response. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and, and we can see it because it's not only you and, uh, and some researcher, it's, there are so many spontaneous uh, initiatives like that, even, uh, even on the Southern Bank, and we, we, we have uh, this example in Tunisia in the middle of nowhere of, uh, of someone uh, who is, uh, is managed uh, a cemetery with the things he gets on, on the beach, and uh, it's, it's yeah, sorry, there is a it's a really extremely deep uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of, of, uh, of uh, initiative. Well, it's okay. I'm I'm sorry. I I, I pressed a little bit uh, uh, on the time because I'm sure there are so many questions. <laughs> it's going it's going to be tricky on the day. I'm sure. So, is anyone uh, want to to start? Yeah, Alessandro. Uh, I thank everyone. Uh, a lot of questions, but.